Again, hello and welcome to this very important talk. I am Professor Jody Russell Manning. I am the program director for the Rowan Center for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide and Human Rights. Um, welcome to our panel discussion about the global impacts of Russia's war on Ukraine. We felt it important to once again have a talk about this ever-changing and shifting events of this war and focus on these broader issues of how this has and will affect the globe and its long-term implications for the world. Thus, while it is always difficult for any of us to predict the future, um, we will do our best to provide informed analysis. Some topics that will be covered include displacement and occupation, parallels to World War II, displacement, international justice and accountability, chances for and obstacles to negotiation, sports world responses, as well as international implications and human rights. This will be an open discussion to unpack the current major actions and consequences from Russia's war. And after a brief introduction, um, the panel will open it up to questions for a broader community conversation. At that time, then please feel free to raise your hand um, or unmute and ask your question. And we will also, of course, take questions in the chat. Um, I would like to thank our co-sponsors for tonight's event, the Hollybush Institute for Global Peace and Security, the History Department, the Department of Political Sciences and Economics, International Studies, and the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. So once again, welcome everyone. We are very happy to have you join this conversation uh, with our esteemed panel. And with that, I will turn it over to our panel moderator, Lawrence Markowitz. Great, thank you. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Lawrence Markowitz. I'm a professor of political science and uh, I'm gonna say a couple of introductory words uh, that have mainly focus on geopolitical and economic considerations because I think the other panelists touch on a range of other issues, um, as was mentioned. Um, <clears throat> we're now in the entering the third month of the conflict and we've all witnessed a number of specific developments that I think are surprising to many of us. The, the surprising success of Ukrainian forces in pushing back the Russian attacks, the, um, <clears throat> the very unfortunate and sad evidence of, of atrocities committed by Russian forces um, Russian troops and, and the bombardment, <clears throat> which raise uh, questions about human rights abuses and discussion about war crimes and even the term genocide is being used. Um, <clears throat> and uh, now we're entering a new phase of the conflict where we're, uh, it's likely to see, a, we're, we're entering a, a point where it's obvious there's going to be a large land confrontation in eastern Ukraine in the region known as the Donbass. Um, there are a number of questions about the future of the conflict in particular, even be, without going thinking more broadly, I think I just noted a couple of quick points is that, and I think Dr. Heinzen later on will touch on this, but the, the atrocities that are being committed make it all the more difficult for there to be concessions down the road. Um, in addition to the dangers and the, and, and the damage of the conflict itself, the uh, economic devastation for Ukraine is quite considerable. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the closing off of the southern port of Odessa and the other southern areas would pretty much effectively shut down the export economy of Ukraine. Um, that is the main export pathway for grain and other exports. It is key to the Ukrainian economy. <clears throat> um, likewise, having a kind of frozen conflict in the eastern part of the country would have long-term economic uh, repercussions for Ukraine because it would uh, obviously undermine international investment. <clears throat> and we're basically looking at the likelihood of a continued war, at least for several months. Um, well, hopefully not, possibly for several months. Thinking more broadly, however, uh, I, I think it's, it's important to note that outside, beyond Ukraine, beyond the region, um, I think it's, it's clear that we are witnessing a major tectonic shift in geopolitical arrangements. Um, <clears throat> for the last 30 years, uh, we have lived in an era of globalization, an era where open international exchange, uh, emphasizing trade, free flow of finance, um, uh, where economic and political liberalization were believed to go hand in hand, um, and, and, and that we had generally entered a period in the wake of the Cold War uh, 
where uh, we were going to see uh, an increase in economic development, an increase of economic, the economic exchange would be like a tide lifting all boats. Um, naturally, that, that did not play out exactly so. There it has generated a lot of inequality, oftentimes within countries as well. <clears throat> but the idea of globalization, the idea that we had been in a period for the last 30 years in which free economic exchange um, that free markets triumphed, would triumph over or would be more important than borders and security interests, um, that is now being reconsidered. And I, I wouldn't say globalization is over, but it is certainly, no, it no longer has the strength and the weight that it did. Uh, we, <clears throat> I think it's fair to say we're entering a new era. Uh, it's going to be hard to define what exactly that is. But this has been this is an era that has been fundamentally, you know, altered by the invasion of, of Ukraine. We're now in a period where a number of countries are uh, putting political and security interests above their economic interests. Uh, Western Europe, Western European countries and several of the countries are now turning much more towards building their armies, devoting resources to uh, increasing their security interests. <clears throat> they're reconsidering Finland and, and, and Sweden and, and other countries are reconsidering their, their geopolitical alliances and thinking of joining NATO. Um, it's, and, and a number of countries in Western Europe and more broadly are reconsidering their foreign economic dependence on Russia and other countries. There's foreign economic dependence in general on energy, on manufacturing and agriculture. So, <clears throat> Uh, and, and, and in addition, uh, there are some who are suggesting or thinking about how there are changing geopolitical alliances or aligning relationships as Russia and China become closer. Um, there's also some question about what is the role of India. Perhaps that's also has some dependent relationships with Russia and, and, and potentially could be with China. So <clears throat> this is an era where things are somewhat shifting geopolitically. In addition, the, the crisis has had profound effects on the global economy. Um, <clears throat> for the world's poorest countries that are very dependent on grain and food exports, this is proven to, this is going to be, uh, 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 have, have very devastating impacts for, for many populations. Um, higher prices for commodities, as well as scarce supplies are going to substantially make things substantially more difficult. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's true for the world's poorest countries. For the world's wealthier countries, especially those in Western Europe that are dependent on energy uh, and, and in particular on natural gas, uh, cutting themselves off from natural gas, and, and there is more and more pressure for them to do so, is going to have considerable economic impacts. For example, if Germany were to cut off its import from Russia, its gas imports from Russia entirely cut them off, which is unlikely in the near future. But there's a lot of pressure on Germany to do so. If it were to do that, its, its economy, by some reports, would contract up to 4%, which is a, a, a substantial impact. Um, in addition to uh, uh, you know, the, the wealthier and the poorer countries, think about them as two different poles, then there are the neighboring countries. Um, <clears throat> in Eastern Europe, of course, these are countries that are, are impacted by re historic refugee flows. And I think Professor Dak will, will touch on that. Um, but also the neighboring economies in Eurasia are very much linked to Russia economically. And <clears throat> they're already experiencing disrupted trade and supply chain issues uh, due to the pandemic. But on top of this, they also now are confronting questions of uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 deeper problems with trade, deeper problems with their supply chains, and then the loss of remittances, the loss of income from migrant laborers who, were, who had been working in, in Russia. <clears throat> and then in a, on top of all this, while it's not directly related to the, to the particular crisis, um, there's, we all know, or we, many, of, many of us should know, <clears throat> excuse me, that the, the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank are planning to raise interest rates, and that's going to have a major impact on credit availability around the globe, 
Many countries are dependent on low, even zero interest rates for their loans. And, um, and, and so some of these are oftentimes the poorest countries that are dependent on loans. And, and these changes, these developments on top of the ones that I just mentioned <clears throat> are likely to impact a number of countries. Some estimates, the World Bank estimates that perhaps 12 countries will default by the, on their international loans by 2022. And there'll be a lot of distress on debtor countries, possibly up to 35 different countries. So these are just some of the geopolitical and economic reverberations, and I guess political re reverberations of this crisis. This, you know, we've all been, um, we've all, we, we could look around the globe and see how there are crises in different parts of the world, uh, but this is, this is a fundamentally different one in terms of its impacts. And I think if you think about it in terms of waves that ripple outward, uh, this one certainly has much greater waves and much, much more uh, comprehensive impacts. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And I think, uh, you know, we can always come back to these in, in the Q&A. Um, and now I'm just going to pass the baton to Professor Mikhail Dak. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Markowitz. And uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Mikhail Dak. I am a historian of modern Europe. And I specialize in Germany and the world wars mostly, as well as the legacies of war in politics and society. So yes, I'm you know, very interested in many facets of, of the, the war in Ukraine and I'm concerned about all of them, but because of my area of research, there are a few specific topics that I find myself thinking a lot about recently. And uh, so I wanna just, just provide some, some kind of some, uh, some brief comments. The, the first is, are these kind of World War II parallels? And, um, there are many similarities, of course. This is the largest war in Europe since 1945. Uh, the artillery strikes, the tank battles, the besieged cities, the urban warfare, they're all disturbingly familiar. Um, there have also been confirmed war crimes, instances of mass rape, and recently claimed the genocide. So yes, the parallels are, are obvious, but also both countries have actively uh, been using World War II memory and, and myths to rally support for their respective causes. And, and they are in a sense, um, as is, I think the New York Times put it this way, fighting for the legacy of World War II. Um, and, uh, and, you know, these, you know, this utilization of World War II memory is far from subtle. We've all, we've all heard them in the, over, the, over the past three months. It's especially true for Putin. I'd say, he, you know, he really is weaponizing the memory of World War II and using it to justify his invasion. Uh, we've heard him talk about liberating Ukraine from Nazis. Um, he talks about denazification and also preventing a genocide of the Russian-speaking population in Ukraine. You probably also heard Putin talking about, about wanting to confirm his military victory over Ukraine uh, by May 9th, which is just three weeks from now. And this is the same day that Russia celebrates its victory in World War II. This is Victory Day. Um, but uh, Zelensky has also evoked World War II history uh, in public addresses. He has quoted Winston Churchill and FDR. And he has been using the memory of World War II to produce a new uh, unifying national narrative around resisting a foreign invader. So aligned with this, there are, there are two experiences that I think are important to consider when we look, we're looking at where the war is headed in Ukraine, and, and especially when discussing gl global implications. The first is uh, displacement. Now, the IOM, last time I checked, and it's always changing, uh, the IOM estimates that about 5 million Ukrainians have fled the country. Um, most have gone to Poland, but also Romania, Hungary, Moldova, and even Russia. Uh, meanwhile, there are, I think there are, in addition, there are 7 million people who have been displaced internally. And this mass movement of people is the largest in Europe since World War II. And, and just like 1945, this crisis is most definitely going to change uh, Europe long after the war ends. Some early estimates believe that in this, just this first year alone, It'll cost about 30 billion for housing, transporting, feeding, and, and processing refugees. And with and while a kind of a giant influx of skilled workers is likely to increase a nation's output over time, it could also intensify competition in the job market. I believe right now the EU unemployment rate is, is, is around 7% and it's increasing. It's about 12 million people. Uh, and this could also result in the rise of, of, of anti-EU sentiments and the bolstering of far-right political parties who don't want to support refugees in the long term, even if they are white and Christian, um, which we can talk about in the Q&A, which is uh, 
uh, disturbing dynamic. But integration of migrants could, could still be very difficult, uh, much like it was for the 12 million Europeans who were displaced after World War II. Um, however, unlike past uh, migration crises, like the one after World War II, but also the more recent one in 2015, where, where 1.3 million refugees from the Middle East and North Africa uh, arrived in Europe, it's still unclear if Ukrainians uh, will stay. Very few thus far have actually formally uh, sought asylum. For example, I think in Romania, who, uh, in, they've received 500,000 refugees, but only 4,000 have asked for asylum. So there's still you know, a big question mark there. But that leads me into my, my, my second kind of war experience that, that I'm following closely, and, um, and that is military occupation. Now, the Russians have a long and violent history of occupation, and, and Dr. Heinzen might touch on this uh, briefly, but, um, but after World War II, um, it invaded and occupied most of Eastern Europe. Um, the Russian military's uh, inability to win a quick victory in Ukraine has left its soldiers in a position that they are vastly unprepared for, and that is holding towns and regions with an unwelcoming local populace. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers in 1968 when the, when the, uh, the Russians arrived in Czechoslovakia and they were told that they were going to be welcomed and celebrated as liberators and they absolutely were not. Uh, this, is, this definitely rings of, of, uh, of um, a similar situation. But, but also personally, I, I'm, I'll, end, I'll end with this. Um, I'm also very concerned about this talk of denazification uh, because while we, we may laugh at this historical comparison here because in some ways the, the very opposite is happening, um, it's still a very scary statement and it's being used more and more. Uh, Putin is essentially telling us that he intends to eliminate the Ukrainian state and its democracy. It's not just about a military victory. And this, this could have global and you know, definitely European repercussions. Um, he plans to put politicians on trial and wage an ideological war against Ukrainian national identity. Putin has quite literally redefined what Nazism is. Um, and so, so any notion, any any language that is perceived as anti-Russian and, and, and pro kind of Ukrainian national identity, he has defined as Nazi. Um, so anyways, I'm a historian, so I try not to make predictions about the future, but with the mind to the past, these are some areas I feel are important and uh, possibly instructive. So thank you. And I believe, is it Dr. Sharnak? Are you, are you up next? Yes, I am. Thank Welcome. you for passing this virtual baton my way. Um, and thank you uh, to the, especially Professor Manning for getting this panel together. Um, for those of you that don't know who I am, I am the Latin American historian um, here at Rowan and also an international historian. And my research focuses um, also on transnational activism and human rights. And part of that in an area of research that I've been, um, you know, dipping my foot into, so to speak, is how sports are used by both governments and athletes alike for all sorts of types of activism. And this is kind of where I will be making an intervention into our panel because what, one thing that has gotten a lot of attention in respect to the Russian invasion of Ukraine has been this, the reaction of international sports, the various bands of athletes, cancellation of sporting events in Russia, as well as athlete denunciations of the invasion. And what I want to do today is talk just very briefly about two levels of protests that have occurred, one at the level of the governing bodies of these sports institutions and the other one at the level of individual athletes. And because I too am a historian, I want to talk just a little bit about what we've seen as both changes and similarities from past reactions to major international political upheaval. And what I want to start off by doing, therefore, is by, by basically dispelling one of the myths, right? Because I think one of the gut reactions that you hear so frequently when you hear about these sports reactions is that, wait, sports aren't supposed to be political, right? Um, the sports are supposed to be free from politics and just a form of entertainment. Um, and, you know, you've seen this a lot really in the United States, particularly in response to athletes like Alan Kaepernick taking a knee or even athletes like LeBron James, there's been a huge upheaval around, um, you know, especially initially uh, his taking on of Black Lives Matters. And so just to start off, like that is a total fallacy. The idea that sports and politics are separate entities. And um, for those of you that are really interested about this, you can take my class in the fall on um, sports, politics, and society in Latin America. But the, the thing I want to really stress here is that 
sports have always been political and the co-mingling of sports and politics is a long-standing feature in international competition. And just a few examples, and I can go on and on and on about this, of course, um, but I want to talk about just a few that might have some parallels to, to, to today is the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, right? That obviously has a lot of parallels. Um, that prompted, in fact, a U.S.-led boycott of the summer 1980 Olympics in Moscow that was ultimately um, uh, the U.S. led 65 other countries in that boycott. There's also, if you think about this on the political level, um, after the Cuban Revolution in 1959 and the deterioration of relations between Cuba and the United States, Fidel Castro actually ended professional baseball in Cuba, but then also forbade Cuban players from playing abroad. And this meant that Cuban players that wanted to play professionally actually had to defect from Cuba and leave their lives and their families behind, especially because if um, a baseball player defected, he would no longer grant any exit visas to their family to go visit. So this was a, you know, a major issue that lasted basically until 2018. Um, so you see then athletes being used in geopolitical relations between two countries. And then you've also seen um, countries and sports governing bodies isolating South Africa in response to its continued practice of apartheid. What you saw there is the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, ultimately banned um, most um, South African athletes from Olympic competition, but you also saw some individual players, um, you know, most prominently Arthur Ashe, actually protesting events in South Africa as well. So I, I, I'll, just those few examples, I, I hope hammer home the idea that What's not interesting in the debates about um, sports and politics is whether sports and politics should or can intermingle, but that they always have. And um, I don't think I'm going out on a limb on my, like, you know, leaving behind my historical hat by saying they likely always will, right? Uh, that's my future prediction for today. So what I do think then is interesting is to talk about the diverse ways that reactions to the Russian invasion are similar or different from some of these past politics. And as I said, I'll talk about this at two levels, one being the sports governing body, and then talk very briefly about individual athletes as well. And so what you have seen in terms of sports governing bodies is the fairly consistent banning of both Russian and Belarusian teams or players from competition. I can give you a very long list and probably take the rest of our time today, but just to name a few, is the International and Para, um, Paralympic, the International Olympic Committee and the Paralympic Committees. FIFA banned the Russian teams, um, the Russian team from uh, continuing to play in the qualifying rounds of the World Cup, which, you know, for you soccer fans out there might not have made a huge difference because they actually aren't that good. Um, and then most recently in terms of um, thinking about sports bodies, just yesterday, Wimbledon and English tennis um, and Lawn Association banned all Russian and Belarusian athletes from participating in the upcoming tour Grand Slam tournament of Wimbledon and any other events that were going to take place in the country in the coming weeks. Originally, actually, what's kind of interesting is that the international governing bodies, not the ones that take place in England, they had actually said, okay, well, athletes can participate. They just can't participate with the Russian or Belarusian flag next to their name. So this is actually going like a huge step further in terms of the denunciation saying they cannot play at all. And unlike soccer, Russia, Russia and um, Belarus have some pretty amazing tennis players. The number two player, male player in the world, for example, Daniel Medvedev, is now not going to be able to compete for this Grand Slam tournament, nor is the number four um, Belarusian player in the world, Ariana Sabalenka. So it has, you know, some real impact in terms of just even the way this, these tournaments are going to be um, run. And so in this, in this way, and I can give you many more examples if you want in the Q&A, what these sports governing bodies are saying is that international sports teams and players are often financially supported by their governments. And also on their, you know, potential victory, what, might, what that might offer is a, a patriotic rallying call. Um, and 
And these are for countries that are in gross violations of international norms. And what these sports governing bodies are saying ultimately is that silence isn't an option. And that especially with pressure from some of their governments, they are going to take a hardline stance. What I don't think these sports governing bodies are trying to do is say that they might alone have an impact on Putin. I think what we've seen thus far is that Putin is pretty undeterred by international condemnation and will likely, I think, remain so in light of these sports bans. Um, in fact, what I would argue is he's actually quite deftly using um, international condemnation as a way to kind of rally Russian victimhood. And this is something obviously we can discuss later as well. But what you do see is these sports governing bodies really coming together to condemn the violation, the gross violations of international norms that these countries are perpetrating. And what is consistent with previous actions is that sports governing bodies, as you heard from some of my examples, are banning countries or players um, from international competition, right? Some of my examples mentioned it. But I actually think what you see as quite original here and quite new is the sort of total condemnation that you've seen across the board from these sports governing bodies and the fairly quick way that they have reacted. What you saw, for example, with the Russian, uh, the US-led boycott of the Olympic, the 1980 Moscow Olympics, was 65 countries boycotted, but 80 still attended. So again, more than half the countries of the world still participated. So it was at best what I would argue partial condem condemnation. And what you've also saw, for example, in the protests of apartheid, it took many, many years for country to begin to protest and for them to be banned um, from international con competition. So the very quick and total condemnation among these sports governing bodies, I think is something that is very notable from our current context. And the second thing that I want to talk about, of course, is player activism. And here there is, in my opinion, a real departure from historical precedent. Because athlete activism has been very real and um, very widespread in this conflict. Many athletes have been vocal against the Russian invasion than I would argue kind of anything else we've seen in the past. For example, and I'm going to go back to tennis here, you may or may not know where my personal interests lie, um, but Alina Svitolina, who is a Ukrainian um, tennis player, she's currently number 25 in the world, is a former number three. She's been incredibly vocal and pushed for the ATP and WTA, in fact, to have um, you know, the to take the flag away from these players' names. She basically said she was going to withdraw from any time that she was going to have to play a Russian or Belarusian player unless the ADP and WTA took action. So even though in the first days they were softer in their condemnation, what you saw is her and the support of so many other athletes um, really pushed the governing body to swiftly denounce and take away the flag. You've also seen pressure from other sports leagues as well. So for example, with the NBA, you saw the two Ukrainian players, Alex Len and going to totally butcher this um, pronunciation, so I apologize, but Svi Mikhailiak, um, they both basically led a, um, a global-wide NBA um, protest, which took the many different forms, but ultimately the result was the NBA pulling out operations from Russia and canceling broadcast contracts. Um, so while most athletes... Um, and I would also say, I just throw in there that many Russian athletes have also um, denounced the war. You've seen them coming out and talking about peace. And um, I think that's also notable. They've stopped short of directly criticizing Putin, but you do see Russian athletes across the board um, also criticizing the war and talking about peace. And as I said, this is the real historical departure. And I think that the reason that this has shifted is twofold. One is mega contracts. I think, for example, when you saw Eastern European players affecting like Martina Navratilova in the 1970s, you didn't see the same activism at the time against, for example, the Soviet Union. And part of this was predicated on it didn't have the financial stability that so many athletes do today to kind of um, take this sort of stand. But I also think social media has fundamentally changed the landscape of athlete activism around the globe. And this has been notable, as I mentioned earlier, not only in 
thinking about this in, in racial terms in the United States, but has been a huge um, and fundamental shift in terms of the way that both individual athletes as well as pushing sports governing bodies take a firmer stand on political issues, especially this one in international politics. So of course, I'm happy to talk about um, anything further in our Q&A, but I hope what I can leave us with is for the very po real political intermingling of sports activism and the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, and the way that this gives us food for thought about the way it's both similar and, and really different in certain ways um, to, to pass uh, sports activism on the global stage. Now, I have the distinct pleasure of handing um, the virtual baton um, to Dr. Zagbo, sorry. Um, and I will very, um, very briefly introduce her just because she is the one non Rowan um, participant on this panel. And we are so grateful to have her here to talk about accountability um, and human rights in terms of this invasion. Um, Dr. Zvagbo is the um, assistant professor of government at William and Mary, and for our purposes, also a founder and director of the International Justice Lab. We are so grateful that she's able to bring her expertise to our community today. So thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to join um, in this really uh, distinguished panel um, of faculty colleagues providing different perspectives on Russia's war with Ukraine. Um, for me, I come in as uh, not a historian. Um, I am the daughter of a historian, <laughs> but, you know, kind of meandered into the lands of political science. And so my special, uh, my, my training is in political science, specifically international relations. And much of my past and ongoing research um, centers on transitional justice. So justice after conflict, right? After, um, after political violence, after authoritarian governments fall, and also on international law international criminal tribunals, including the International Criminal Court. So I thought I would provide um, some remarks um, that touch on these, um, these different areas. So there's been um, a lot of talk about war crimes, crimes against humanity, and even genocide um, by Russian forces in Ukraine. What are all of these things and what do they mean? Um, and is there an opportunity for meaningful accountability for Russian forces um, for abuses in Ukraine? Well, first, um, war crimes are essentially violations of the laws of war. So yes, um, we can fight wars and you know, people being injured, people dying, or that's kind of the collateral damage of war. And, and deaths are not um, disallowed by international law, um, but certain types of deaths and injuries are outlawed, right? And so in terms of war crimes, we can talk about willful killing. We can talk about, um, we can talk about, um, um, ill treatment of prisoners of war. Uh, we can talk about, you know, deportations, detentions, et cetera. Um, and so, um, and, you know, targeting of civilians would be a war crime. Now, there is this second category of crimes against humanity, which encompasses many of these same abuses that I've mentioned. But the key here is that it is systematic and widespread and that there's a clear intention. This is part of the state's plan. This is part of the military mission, right? Um, and so um, if you haven't already noticed, there are some crimes that can be tried in these different categories. I talk about war crimes, so violations of the laws of war, the Hague Convention, the Geneva Conventions, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, and many others, okay? Um, so humanitarian law, laws of war, or international criminal law. Um, so war crimes, crimes against humanity, systematic, widespread, part of the mission, not just, you know, people on the ground who are acting of um, their own volition um, to enact such unspeakable violence, but this is part of the campaign, part of the mission by design and by choice. And we have genocide, um, which it's been interesting to see um, in different pockets of academia and among politicians and in the media, some people's willingness um, to apply the genocide label, including um, and all the way up to um, uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky of uh, Ukraine and others' unwillingness. So let's unpack that. So what is genocide? Genocide is a set of acts that includes killing, but is actually not limited to killing, right? Um, any act that is intended to destroy in whole or in part 
um, a national, religious, ethnic, or um, racial group. Um, and so it includes killing, but also can involve um, forced sterilization, can involve forced pregnancy, can be involved to, you know, psychological um, harm, uh, mental harm that is meant to, again, destroy in whole or in part. Um, so it doesn't have to be killing. No one has to die. And it doesn't have to be, you know, this expansive killing like we saw, you know, with an estimated 800,000 people in Rwanda, right? Doesn't have to be like, you know, Srebrenica, uh, does not have to be like um, what the Khmer Rouge did, right, in Cambodia. Um, no one actually has to die for genocide. And also there are a bunch of other crimes in the um, related crimes in the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, uh, which include even conspiracy to commit genocide, right, and kind of like the planning. Okay, but why there resistance among some corners? Well, one, um, I and of course, um, uh, is the, um, is Ukrainians and Russians are viewed by people in a lot of the world as, you know, not that different. 30 years ago, they were all part of the same Soviet Union. They're, you know, Russian speakers in Ukraine. They're ethnic Russians in Ukraine. Everyone's white. So, you know, and mostly Christian. So like, is this really genocide? It doesn't quite hearken to um, what some call the, the spectacular, that is um, with respect to the spectacle, right, of violence that we saw, for example, with the with the Shoah, so the Jewish Holocaust, and more generally the Holocaust in Europe and Rwanda, in the, in the Balkans, and in other regions. Um, and so it doesn't, for us, really scream, you know, genocide for many people. And it's not just, you know, ethnic Ukrainians and Ukrainian speakers who are being killed, right? It's also ethnic Russians and, um, and uh, uh, Russian speakers. And also just people from many other countries, many other groups. Ukraine is a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multiracial society. And so it's kind of like hard to make the argument either about religion or about race or about ethnicity. And so some people are like, it doesn't fit the bill of what I understand to be genocide um, or what I have inductively reasoned to be genocide based on, based on precedent of cases that we've seen, which is actually distinct from the actual um, prohibitions against genocide if you look at the convention. And I wanna to point to the idea of a national group, right? And so tying back to the point raised earlier about denazification, you know, Vladimir Putin, um, a lot of his, um, um, a lot of people in the upper echelons of power, his allies have said things like Ukraine is not even a real state. A Ukrainian national identity is like an accident of history, right? It's the product of Western interference. It's not genuine or homegrown. And, you know, should Ukraine fall? And in their, in, uh, by their estimates, when Ukraine falls, right, um, there will be this plan to denazify, which basically means like eliminating Ukrainian um, national identity, revitalizing um, language um, and cultural revitalization efforts at the last um, several years and decades, et cetera, right? And so if we think of the civic nation, right, if we think of Ukrainian nationality as the relevant group, as the relevant target, right, for this destruction in whole or in part of a national group, then I think an argument is to be made there. So argument can be made. Why are people resistant to make it? Well, I mentioned that 1948 convention, the very first um, uh, human rights treaty to come out of the, um, the United Nations created just three years earlier in 1945, which is the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. So this is not just a hands tying device for countries. You don't commit this crime amongst your population, right? It is an instruction for other states to both make meaningful efforts to prevent and to punish. And so it implies obligation. And I think that's why some actors are unwilling because it means that we have to intervene. There's this whole doctrine called the responsibility to protect. And I think that um, responsibility, that norm is kind of coming up against um, a separate related but competing interest which is, um, which is non-use of uh, nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. And so I think were this not a superpower, we might have seen meaningful military intervention by countries such as the United States and by members of the NATO alliance, right? But because of this um, concern about nuclear use and there is, um, there is not really the appetite for military intervention, um, which is why I think um, Ukraine 
has not been admitted into NATO because it would imply certain obligations all for one, one for all being the idea. And so there's kind of three um, major sets of crimes. We also have the crime of aggression, um, which is you know, but just violation of the most fundamental norm of international relations, which is territorial integrity of the state and sovereignty over domestic, um, over domestic affairs. Now, where can you get international justice for these crimes? Well, generally the best place is at home, right? International courts, regional courts are courts of last resort, right? We leave it to domestic institutions to handle international justice. That is the, that is the best dream and hope of international justice. But that's, not, that's happening in Ukraine, not happening in Russia. There's some avenues that I'll mention very briefly. There's the International Court of Justice, which is currently um, examining a dispute between Ukraine and Russia over um, Russia's uh, accusation of genocide um, against Ukraine, uh, which it has used as the pretext for war. And so basically Russia has said, We're, we intervened in, in, you know, in full compliance with international laws because we are preventing genocide. And Ukraine says, that's rubbish. This is a bad pretext for war. Also, there's evidence of the actus reus. And so that is, um, that is one of the elements of the genocide crime and that basically accusing uh, Russia of committing genocide. Anyway, so we're going to see that case resolved. But that's really about interstate um, relations, about state um, dis dispute settlement. Nobody's going to go to jail regardless of that. And the ICJ has issued interim orders asking Russia um, to, to withdraw. Russia has not complied. European Court of Human Rights deals with human rights, so individual rights. Again, still state responsibility, though. And so, um, and Russia has left the Council of Europe, has been kicked out. So not sure if we'll see meaningful um, justice there. Um, International Criminal Court is great. So that would handle individual criminal accountability. Key challenge though, is getting people into custody because you can't try people in absentia. Um, and last, and what I think is the best hope for international accountability for Russian crimes um, in Ukraine, international crimes, is through this doctrine called universal jurisdiction. Some crimes are so heinous that they require other countries to be able to claim jurisdiction. And so we've seen Poland and a lot of, um, and a lot of um, other Eastern European states beginning war crimes probes. Um, and I think that's where we are likely to see the, um, the quickest and most widespread justice. Um, and so really um, living up to this idea of complementarity, where it is domestic jurisdictions that take on the bulk of international justice and bodies of the International Criminal Court um, being, a, being a last resort um, and handling not just the situation, but you know, really having a global mandate. And so um, that's where we are. I'm happy to engage questions later. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Zvalagbo, for those really interesting comments. Um, I'm Jim Heinsen. I'm a professor of history here at Rowan. I'm also the director of the Hollybush Institute for Global Peace and Security. My interest um, today comes from the fact that um, I'm a specialist in Russian history, spent, has spent quite a bit of time there, and also that uh, the Hollybush Institute is dedicated to sort of examining diplomacy and ways that countries can uh, cooperate and get over conflict and uh, this is a, a lovely case study in that, although perhaps the most difficult one that we've seen in Europe since World War II. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the chances um, for negotiations and the obstacles to negotiations in this case. Um, one of the biggest questions is what's going to happen in the long term. Of course, nobody really knows what the end game is going to look like, but I think we can expect more of the same in the near term. Uh, more false justifications of the war as a denazification campaign rolled into this, this weird mythology, as Dr. Dak mentioned, that Ukraine is controlled by Nazis. I think we're going to see more attacks on civilians, as Dr. Zogbo mentioned, more brutality, more, more gross violations of human rights, and more refusal of Russia to really negotiate. So um, against, against this backdrop, prospects for negotiations are very poor right now. Um, all the talks of ceasefires or pauses to allow civilians to evacuate, for example, have, have been temporary. And the Russian side is not willing to really negotiate on anything of substance. And it's sort of alarming. This reminds me of, of the two wars that Russia waged against Chechnya in the 1990s. And Chechnya was a breakaway republic that declared its independence, and Russia wanted it to come back into the Russian Federation. And they they attacked Chechnya and brought them back over the course of really a whole decade of on and off war. And in that, in that um, 
conflict, Russia would negotiate and they would settle, you know, they come up with some kind of ceasefire. And that was just sort of a, a pretext for them to come back later and finish the job. And there would be a peace plan that would be imposed by Russia. And then later Russia would come back and back out of the peace plan, claiming some kind of offense by the other side and begin the assault again. And this war resulted in the complete leveling of the city of Grozny. I mean, it was completely, there were like no buildings standing. It was a city of four or 500,000. It was a Russian speaking city and it was part of Russia at the time. Um, and the Russian actions in Syria over the last few years have been similarly brutal. Um, so the fact of the matter is though, that, um, diplomacy has to play a role and will play a role in this conflict, both in the short term, in terms of negotiating a short term ceasefire and in any long term outcome. Um, but it's very hard to see right now how that will happen. I just want to talk a little bit about what the two sides have, have proposed so far. Um, interestingly enough, there have been negotiations going on in Turkey, uh, although ha there haven't really been any, hasn't really been any progress that we know of, but both sides do have positions. Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, has been very clear that he's willing to negotiate and maybe he can find some kind of formula. Um, but you know, beyond the short-term deals, will the Russians really be willing to compromise in the long term? And that's a big question. If you look at what Putin wants, he keeps saying that he hasn't changed his goals since the beginning of the war, which is also concerning because his goals at the beginning of war were, were what he called the denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine. Um, so Dr. Dak mentioned trials, uh, mentioned sort of, uh, he didn't mention it, but Putin has in mind the sort of decapitation of the government apparatus of the leadership. Um, this is, again, very alarming. Wow. Concretely, if we look at the concrete goals on the ground, he wants the full recognition of the Crimea as part of Russia. This is the peninsula that um, has been in dispute since 2014, as well as full recognition of Luhansk and Donetsk, which are two, the two breakaway regions in the east where the Russians right now, this week, have been concentrating their forces and seem to be you know, preparing a major assault on those areas. Um, if these territories were controlled, it would, con it would create a land corridor along the south coast, um, east from Crimea to the Russian border. Now, Zelensky has said that he is not willing to agree to any loss of territory. So um, that will probably have to change um, it's certainly a non-starter at the moment. Russia will probably also want Ukraine to, to declare that they're a neutral country. Uh, and Zelensky has offered that. So they would be sort of like Austria is now, or Sweden, although Sweden is now trying to get into NATO because they are so uh, worried about Russian attack on Ukraine. Um, but it would be sort of um, the sticking point here is that Ukraine would need security guarantees. That, that is, they need a recognition that its borders are permanent and inviolable and that, so, that the sovereignty of the country can't be uh, threatened. So Zelensky has proposed that Ukraine would be neutral, but it would be admitted into the EU, which is something that Russia as of now would not allow. And they, they, Ukraine is also saying that they need guarantees of their security, and this is what they've proposed, that if there were an attack on Ukraine, then the US and uh, the UK and Turkey and France, these countries would come to their assistance to protect a neutral Ukraine. And at the moment, again, there's no reason to think that Russia would follow through on such guarantees, even if they made them. Um, Russia also will probably ask for some kind of demilitarization, that is a a neutralizing of the Russian military, much similar to what happened to Germany after World War I. And you know, Ukraine would not agree to that because they need to defend themselves to feel secure. So, and, you know, on, on top of all of these problems, um, we have to lay on top of that the recurrent Russian war crimes against civilians 
that make it even more difficult for the Ukrainians, not only to reach an agreement, but really just to even sit at the same table with Russia. So just to conclude, I'll say that one thing that Russia has done, and this is contrary to its own interests, is they've created a permanently unstable southern border, the one that it shares with Ukraine. And what's maybe worse for Russia, they've created this, this multi-generational enemy right at its doorstep. And that, that seems like that will go on for, for decades, if not longer. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. And I'd, I'd like to turn things back over to Larry. Great. Thank you all. Um, there's a lot of great comments there. Uh, we went a little longer than we thought. So we were originally thinking that, you know, then I would pose some questions to each of the panelists and we would have some discussion. But I think it's better if we just sort of open it up for the, for the rest of you. Um, I, I'm not sure, uh, Professor Manning, have we seen any questions come in with the... I mean, I have, I have questions. Yet. Okay, nope. so I, I have questions that I can ask. So um, I'll take, I'll seize the moment so we don't waste a second. Please go ahead and add your questions in um, into the chat, right? Is that correct? Uh, yes, or you can raise your hand as well. Um, absolutely. And we can call on you. <coughs> and I can mute and go ahead and ask the question. Great. I got, I got one question for each of the panelists real quick. Um, and, and they can decide if they want to answer or we just go to the questions that come in as we go along. Uh, for Professor Doc, um, this idea of how, how Putin has invented this idea of, or, or misused or altered the idea of denazification is really quite scary, as you noted. And it could, I wonder if you might speculate on how this might be used by others. And now that it's been kind of like branded as, and it can be, you know, weaponized, it seems like this is sort of like a, a new way to manipulate and use memories of World War II for anyone's strategic purposes, because they're so distorted. Who knows who could take it up? Like, imagine Burundi using this against Rwanda or something like that. So, um, and then for Professor Sharnak, um, <clears throat> the idea that uh, 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 sports and politics are interwoven is, is, is absolutely so clear and, and, and I think that we all kind of knew it, and now it's it's becoming quite much more explicit. And the way you laid it out was really nice that you kind of laid it out in such a clear way. <clears throat> I wonder if um, kind of the the bans on different athletes in different countries, to what extent uh, you know does this really undercut the legitimacy of states? And and I think that they they do they have more of an impact on autocratic regimes because a lot of autocratic regimes. I think especially like Russia, but other countries, China and other countries use these sporting events to kind of assert their, their legitimacy. And it's kind of like translating or somehow making their sports prowess kind of spill over to national prowess. And there's a whole gender component to that, by the way, and how they assert their, you know, autocratic prowess, prowess and, and power through winning in sports. And there's obviously, <clears throat> so I wonder, are autocratic regimes particularly vulnerable to this kind of ban, or is am I just speculating here? Um, for Dr. Zvobgo, uh, <clears throat> you, you should definitely come and visit some of my classes to help me teach international law and, and accountability, because you're quite clear in laying out the different levels in, uh, of, of accountability or levels of crimes and the different institutions uh, let me be kind of provocative <clears throat> and say, like, maybe, it, I mean, are we now in a new world order where it's a, a multipolar order where international law and human rights is like it's a two tiered game? Countries that violate international law and commit human rights abuses will have their you know, perpetrators sent to the ICC, to International Criminal Court, or there'll be an ad hoc tribunal set up. But if you're a powerful economy like China, or your powerful nuclearly, nuclearly, nuclear armed state like Russia, um, you know, the, the reach of the law, the long arm of the law does not reach that far. So is, you know, as I kind of alluded to earlier that now that we're no longer in a hopeful era of globalization, perhaps now it's more clearly evident that there's sort of two rules in play. Um, and then <clears throat> for Professor Heinz in, Again, being provocative, 
Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, given the, the war crimes and given the other atrocities and the other abuses and, and, and the unprovoked nature of the, of the invasion, um, putting your cap on as the director of the Hollywood Institute and, and, and trying to come up with some kind of path towards negotiation is quite admirable, but is there any kind of negotiation that can continue if Putin is still in power? How can there be, how can you have like a negotiated settlement between two states where the leader of a state, leader of one of those states is being charged with or indicted with crimes of being a war criminal or carrying out war crimes or suspected or assumed to be. It, it, I, there has to be a way forward to negotiate an end to the conflict. Um, but this seems to be a very intractable issue. So um, if you could just kind of solve this major international crisis for us, uh, we'd be much obliged. Um, I, I don't know if, should we throw, do you guys want to just sort of, someone want to step up and grab the question? I'd actually make up, make another call for questions from the audience and maybe we could incorporate your questions into their questions a little bit. Um, oh, there we go. Sean French. Hi, thank you very much. And thank you for the discussion today. Um, it's been great hearing all the comments. Uh, my question had to do, uh, Dr. Markowitz mentioned at the start about possibly entering into a new era of international uh, studies, international politics. Um, I'm not going to ask for predictions, uh, maybe uh, pulling from history a little bit. I was wondering how relations are preserved between states when these blocks are maybe cementing, not necessarily just the West and Russia and Belarus, and then the three other countries that voted with them in the United Nations uh, General Assembly of vote last month, but also from the non-aligned uh, perspective. Um, I know we didn't, uh, or it was mentioned, I think India and uh, a few other countries at some points, non-aligned countries in this, but they're not totally non-aligned. They obviously have a dog in the game um, if you will, and they work with these other countries, be it with India and uh, arms deals they have with Russia and so on. So I was wondering how relations are preserved there with America or other countries in NATO trying to push India to do more or China getting involved. I don't want to go on too long, but that's the gist of it. Great. That's an excellent question. Luckily, we have on the panel an international relations expert. So Dr. Zvobko can, you know, grab that one if she wants. I, I mean, I have some thoughts too, but um, be, before I, you know, put, put her on the spot, um, are there other questions? That was a good one. There's one in the chat about how do you think the U.S. will play a role in letting in more refugees from Ukraine? Bill Zoda, I see your hand up. Sure. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I, I appreciate the conversation about the denazification uh, it's, if there's a, something that I think we're kind of falling short on, uh, it's that pot calling the kettle black is, is pretty bad there. And we talk about oligarchs a lot, but we don't actually talk about like the fascism that's driving the Russian ideology and, and was kind of the foundation for this invasion, right? You have Rasputin like characters like this guy Dugan who has a dotted line to Steve Bannon and they have this this view of the world that is a lot of the fuel for what's driving you know the Russian uh, invasion into Ukraine and of course there's Russian battalions who are fascists and you know the the Wagner group has a direct line to the Russian government and and that army the guy who found it's got Schutzstaffel tattoos all over him so objectively, there are actually more Nazis and more fascism in the Russian side, not only in their actions, but also in what's driving their ideology. And, you know, I think the global we need to do a better job of when we're criticizing what's going on there is saying, you know, this really is is like a, a kind of a fascism coming home to roost in, in Russia. Uh, and that's uh, you know, I don't think we're doing a good job of doing that, you know, and, and the people who are walking this tightrope like Orban and sometimes even Erdogan are flirting with their own, you know, kind of extreme right ideologies. And it's not a coincidence that they're kind of wishy-washy on what's happening, you know, during the invasion. 
So I just wanted to kind of put that out there as a, as a comment, I guess. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So, uh, and, and, and there's another question. What is Israel's position uh, regarding the ongoing Ukrainian-Russian uh, conflict? <clears throat> um, let's turn it over to the panelists and see what they think. Yeah, I'm happy to get us going. Um, so, yeah, there have been a, a lot of um, very interesting um, politics at the UN um, recently. Um, and we're talking to my students about um, what they described as some grade A trolling um, of Ukraine um, by, um, or rather, of Russia by Ukraine. When um, one of the members of the delegation said, Whenever did we formally accept Russia as a member state of the United Nations <laughs> um, after the devolution of the, um, of the Soviet Union? I was like, Oof, okay, shots fired. Anyways, um, so that was a very um, interesting conversation. Look, um, here's the bottom line. I think if the international system is to um, uh, be universal, both in theory in, and in application, there's going to need to be some serious institutional reform um, because right now we are set up, um, to your point, um, Professor Markowitz, about um, we are... Um, by design and by choice to have a two-tiered system of law and of justice, right? And so when um, a country can vote, um, can veto a resolution to denounce their actions and to call for, you know, cessation of military operations, when there is a clear conflict of interest to still be able to uh, apply a veto, I think is a major problem. And so I think, you know, and now this is not, what I think is likely to happen, but I think what should happen is serious um, reform in the UN Security Council, perhaps when it is, you know, a matter involving you that you don't get a vote, right? I mean, as faculty, we don't get to vote on our own tenure or promotion or, you know, um, whether we get distinguished professor or whatever, right? Our colleagues do that. And so I think there, um, there are some serious uh, problems to the current design and application of international institutions. I was talking about the International Court of Justice earlier. Um, guess who their main enforcement mechanism is? Oh, yes, the UN Security Council. So even when the ICJ says Russia must halt all military operations and guarantee that forces within its influence, in other words, separatist forces in the Donbass, you know, also cease operations, the enforcement, any enforcement come from the UN Security Council where Russia, again, can veto. And so I think um, that's the first thing um, I think um, this has been coming up a lot. Actually, in my classes, not my students are very um, into the idea of there being accountability for um, for great powers in international um, legal institutions, including the United States. So, you know, hope springs eternal. They're like, yeah, war crimes prosecutions for people, you know, suspected of atrocity crimes, whether they're Russian or British or uh, American. And that's all very encouraging. Um, so, you know, it gives me some reason for optimism while otherwise normally feeling quite dejected um, by things. And, you know, people have called the International Criminal Court, you know, anti-African, anti-Semitic, anti-US. And I'm just like, wow, if this court is so anti-everyone, like who is it for? Now, of course, this is all political. This is all, um, you know, this is all bluster. But um, I do think why the ICC and other um, international organizations are seen as neo-imperial, even neo-colonial, is that while they intend to be universal in theory, they are not universal in practice, right? So, you know, who's going to turn over, like, if they were ever to leave the U.S., um, which they haven't really been traveling internationally, like Dick Cheney and like George Bush, like to the Hague, right? Like part of why we are having, um, we're kind of like knocking our heads against the wall about, you know, international accountability for Russia is that we have been part of the um, undermining of the International Criminal Court, right? The, the Brits have been part of the undermining of the International Criminal Court. And so it seems very convenient and almost like international justice a la carte to all of a sudden be very supportive of, you know, um, accountability for non-members, right? Because it's Russia and because it's not us. And so um, I think... Um, we all have to participate in international institutions for them to work for all of us. And I'm just not sure if there is a willingness there. Um, and I think to speak to the issue of like, um, you know, it's very interesting. I haven't heard like unaligned states used um, in a non like 1980s, 1990s discussion. So that was a very interesting intervention. I'm from Zimbabwe originally. So we were considered the unaligned states or um, uh, better known as the third world, right? Which is now a concept and a term, a construct that's being reclaimed by folks in the global South. Um, 
But yeah, like everyone can read the writing on the wall, like powerful states can get away with a lot. And if you want to remain within powerful state spheres of influence and get to enjoy the fringe benefits of allyship, economic or otherwise, then you abstain or you vote against measures that would strive to hold them accountable. And I think we are all worse off. And Ukraine is really showing us how the international community did not cause this, right? So I don't want to do this like weird victim blaming, right? Um, But created permissive conditions for Russia to do exactly this. Putin has been very honest um, in terms of what he intends to do, and he has done it. So 2008, war with Georgia, not crazy sanctions intervention, right? Crimea, the Donbass, Syria, like crosses a line, gets away with it every time. And so, you know, why are we surprised that this happened? That's a question that I keep asking. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, we don't, we don't have much time left, so maybe we'll have each panelist take like two or three minutes and just make a answer and maybe a closing thought. I need to address um, Connor's question briefly. I'm not an, an expert necessarily on um, Israeli relations uh, with uh, Russia or the Ukraine, but um, just to try to attempt to give you an overview and, and anyone feel free to jump in as well, that Israel's... Um, played a little bit of of a more moderate position in terms of its international condemnation. Um, What you you see uh, with Israel, I think, is is twofold, right? The first thing is um, Israel has a lot of enemies and tries very hard to, when possible, not um, garner new ones. And so what you've seen with Israel um, thus far is that they've tried to, you know, basically... um, basically play play a moderate role and also to offer to be a negotiator between the stu- two states because they have an open channel of communications before both. What's kind of tricky, and I think, um, you know, there's, there's the assumption that because Zelensky is Jewish that Israel would potentially um, favor him. But actually, when Zelensky first went to Israel and asked for arms, Israel just declined um, outright. And what you've seen now just in the last few days, actually, is that Israel is going to provide defensive equipment, like so protective gear. But we're talking about, you know, six weeks into this conflict. Um, so very late in terms of providing any sort of aid. And um, what you've also seen in terms of Israel is that they are, um, they are very careful not to directly criticize Putin. Um, So I think that is also, you know, as opposed to other states that are talking about the crime of aggression and so on and so forth, um, Israel is is really playing a moderate role, which is, I think, due to both, as I mentioned, them having so many other enemies in the world, but also because of the vast cultural ties, um, because Israel does have so many both um, Ukrainian nationals as well as um, Russian people as as well that live within its borders. So it's a tricky in that respect as well. I hope that gave you like a brief overview. And if anyone wants to add anything, please go ahead. Yeah, I could say a couple quick kind of uh, concluding remarks to, to respond to, to you, Dr. Marowitz, Marowitz and also uh, Bill's uh, comment or question about denazification. And, and you're, and you're both, you're both right. I agree completely that this is, this is, this is disturbing, you know, kind of the, the, what Putin is telling us using this language and what it, uh, uh, what it assumes. So um, I think it was, I think it's Jason Stanley, maybe it was Timothy Snyder who says that the first thing fascists do is, 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 is call their enemies fascists. And I think that is, is very much the case here. This is exactly what's happening. And like, like Bill said, this is, you know, we lose sight of this, that, that, that uh, I have no reservations of calling Putin a fascist. He absolutely is. And, his, uh, and, you know, if we can trust the last election in Russia, I think, you know, 85% of Russians um, voted for his party. Um, Ukraine, it was like, I think like 2.5% of, U- of uh, Ukrainians voted for far right parties in the last election. They, they, the far right was pummeled and they, they did not do well at all. Um, so, so, so if you can get away with calling a democratic country that has a very small far right movement, um, a Nazi state, then uh, that is dangerous because it has gained currency. And, and people ask me all the time about it. Um, are there Nazis in Ukraine? And this obsession with, with, with fixating on a very small group, this, this, um, Azov battalion that's fighting the Donbass, like it's the, the you know the, the media is is 
part of the problem here because we just we, they're producing so many articles and interest in this very small group of 900 soldiers who are neo-Nazis, but it's been kind of exaggerated to be this larger movement or, or ideology. So, um, but yeah, it's yeah, it's it's uh, bizarre and and disturbing that 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 Russia, which is in some ways a fascist state, is uh, is uh, is calling its enemies fascists. But yeah, Dr. Heinzen. Yeah, your question about you know how do you how do you how do you negotiate um, when you have uh, an accused war criminal at the head of one of the states, and of course it's it's very difficult. And um, but I would point out that in history there have been a number of similar cases, things that looked equally intractable, in which one side or the other was, or typically both sides were accused of war crimes. I mean, um, the Vietnam War, of course, uh, the French in Algeria. Northern Ireland, Yugoslavia. These were all cases where the, the, the conflict seemed intractable, lasted for decades. And um, um, somehow the diplomats got in there and they resolved it. They resolved it one way or the other. And I think that, um, you know, I don't know how you do it exactly. I leave that to the professional diplomats, but I, I do hear them talking about the need for, you know, for diplomacy and getting in there. Zelensky himself is calling for negotiations with Putin, professional face-to-face, you know, negotiations. And he has, you know, he's witnessed the worst of the war crimes. And there's probably no one who believes more strongly that Putin is a war criminal than Zelensky. Yet he, he sees that negotiation is what is going to stop this conflict in the short term. And, you know, he hopes in the long term, but I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, super optimistic about any kind of you know, love fest at the end of this. But I do think that, that these types of conflicts are ended through negotiation one way or the other. Great, great. And we, we ended right at 6.15. Um, let me take a, a last minute to uh, thank you all for, for uh, coming to the panel <clears throat> and, and thank our panelists for such an informed discussion, um, really benefiting not only from your different uh, topical areas, but your different disciplinary interests. Uh, historians it may have felt like I was asking them, we were asking them to drive the wrong way on a one-way street by looking to the future. They don't look that way. They look backwards, right? So, uh, but it, it seems like uh, taking a look backwards can provide some guidance for what's ahead. Um, and likewise, uh, as a political scientist with Dr. Zwelbko, I think, uh, you know, hopefully we offered a little bit of insight as well and kept, kept pace with our historian colleagues. Um, thank you all. And uh, maybe we'll hopefully see you at a, another panel. Good luck finishing up the rest of the semester and have a good summer. Okay. Thanks. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to the audience. Thank for coming as well. Thank you.